All right, come on, let's stand to our feet as we worship, as we call on, the God, on, on, on our God this morning, as we sing our praises to Him. We realize that our help this morning comes from one place, and we look to Him today. We focus our attention and our hearts upon Him. So let's sing this together. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you, yeah, we turn to you, and hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you, yeah, we long When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away.
So glad you're here with us today. We got a special service. Once you have a seat. Good morning, Bridge Community. How are you? Uh, good to see y'all here this morning. Good crowd for the 8:30 service. Uh, first of all, I just want to say again, thank you for coming, and wanted to let you know today's service is going to be a little different. We have uh, two missionaries that are coming here today. Uh, to share what God is doing in their life, uh, Tyler and Jacqueline Aldridge. Tyler is from Blackshear, Georgia. And the cool, cool testimony of my connection with Tyler uh, is when I was a youth pastor in another church here uh, down the road uh, while Tyler was in high school, um, I remember challenging our students, you know, saying, you know, God has the ability through the gospel, uh, through Jesus Christ, to change any hearts. And uh, I challenged our students at that point. I said, I want you guys to be praying about the people that come to your mind that strike you as, I don't, I don't see how they're going to come to know Jesus. You understand? I don't know how uh, they, 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 they're just either, you know, doesn't seem to care anything about it or obstinate to it. And um, as I said, guys, God can change any heart. And so I remember uh, Tyler Aldridge's name being put down there, you know, on that sheet of paper. And I remember... Uh, for, gosh, probably half a year, uh, our student leadership team praying for Tyler Aldridge, you know, praying for God to work in his life. Uh, and uh, then about, I guess, I don't know, nine months ago, was it, that me and you started talking? Was it probably a nine months, almost to a year ago, me and Tyler got to sit down, and I got to hear uh, God's grace story in his life. And, uh, you know, praise the Lord, you're going to hear that today. You're going to hear about how God came and uh, captured his heart. Uh, you're going to hear about how he captured his family's heart <clears throat> and now how he's captured their calling in life and what they're going to do. And so Tyler and Jacqueline, we are honored to have you. Uh, not kiddingly, I, I told him in that meeting, I said, man, I, I need you just now start praying for some of those students that were praying for you, you know, <laughs> in that meeting. But uh, uh, I am so excited about what Jesus is doing uh, in this young man's life and his wife's life and their two kids and so I'm going to turn it over to him now Tyler uh, you take the time you need brother to share what God's doing on your heart uh, when you get done today uh, you and Jacqueline will come up when you get done you just pray and then Darren's going to come up behind you okay but let's welcome Tyler and Jacqueline as they come up y'all It's just an honor for us to get to come here and just share. And Chris is right. <laughs> um, our relationship when I was in high school, when I wasn't walking with the Lord, it's pretty interesting. We, I just remember our interactions, just we didn't see eye to eye. We would go for a coffee or I'd go hang out at, when he was doing youth ministry at First Baptist. And I would say, hey man, I don't, I don't know if your faith, your Bible is legit, but I mean, look at me now. I'm, we're partnering and we're laboring in the gospel together. We're brothers in the Lord. I mean, last year, we got to sit at this table and just talk about the difficulties and the hardships and the love of ministry. So it's really cool um, just to get to share. But Jacqueline, I want to thank you just for receiving us with open arms. Um, it is such a blessing for us to be here to be able to share with you about the missionary organization we're a part of, Cadence International, and how we're exalting Christ in the nations through the lives of transformed military people. And uh, for, as far as for mine and Chris's story, some of you may have people in your lives who don't know the Lord. Continue to press into that. It wasn't years later until the Lord sought me through his word. So continue to pray for your brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters, anyone in your life. The Lord is the one who changes our hearts and it is his power. Salvation rests on him. So just continue to intercede with those people. Continue to pray for them. And just continue to press into God's grace because the fact that we're here right now working together and laboring together, that's worthy of an amen if I've ever heard of one. So. <clears throat> so before I get into some of our own personal stories, um, I'm sure some of you guys may be asking yourself, these guys want to go and serve the military. That's what Cadence targets. We, we, why do we need to send people out to the military, right? They have chaplains, there's churches everywhere. 
all around them. Surely there isn't a need for missionaries to go out to these members and their families. But this is, this is something that's been told to us before. We live in the seminary. We are our, uh, The International Missions Board for the SPC community is in our backyard. Um, but beneath the uniform is a person God loves with whom we are delighted to share the gospel and our lives with. So that's the big question is why the military? Currently, there's 1.3 million active duty members and 8,000 reserve members right now. And that's not even including spouses and their kids. The majority of all these individuals do not embrace Christ as their savior. Now, far be it from me, but like, do what? Sorry guys. It's 8.30, technical difficulties. Everybody hear me good here? Nice. Now, far be it from me, but that sounds like an unreached people group, if I've ever heard one. That's two million people, just members, not even their family and children. These are the very soldiers we see who are signed up to serve and potentially fight and die for our country. There's such a yearning in my heart that they would see Jesus. Yeah. Is it good now? Sweet. I don't hear any feedback or any hum on my end. There's a big yearning in my heart to see that these people would see Jesus as their king and the Lord of their lives because for a lot of them, the day-to-day is life and death. And that question of salvation becomes even more of a reality. Jacqueline and I served in the Air Force for six years and we were both medics working and laboring with our partners in our units. And it was a joy to be a part of that community. Once you've been a part of a military community, it's, it's a hard place to leave because you've all labored and struggled in the exact same way with training and relocations and deployments and just frustrations of working in this kind of place together. And the culture is one that is hard. Every military member in their family struggles with being frequently relocated, picking up and moving themselves every two to four years potentially to a country they didn't want to go to. I mean, imagine these kinds of issues that you are, you know, are an essential part of your life. It's a part of your life to move to a place where you might not get to want to go. This constant displacement on your household, picking up all your stuff, picking up your friends and family, picking up your children and saying, hey, I know you just made friends and it's okay. We're going to go somewhere else and make new friends and family. And you add on top of that that families are separated with long deployments to places where they might not come back. There's also widespread culturally normative alcohol abuse, high volume of depression and anxiety. The divorce rate is astronomical. Adultery is normal. It's just that all of it's at a much higher rate than any non-military family. And all this is even normalized within the culture. When you go to your work and your boss and your boss's boss are making it okay to do it, and they say, hey, let's go out and just be involved in the same kind of environment. It's, it's hard to see any other way when everyone around you is doing this. But the Lord is moving. Instead of seeing this as a burden, we see it as a place for the gospel to move. It's really common for us to understand that during suffering is sometimes when Christ is really humbling and moving rapidly in our lives. Many of these military members and their families all feel vulnerable and alone and desperate for community. And this is where we get to step in as cadence with the military. The gospel has always been a place for the intentionality of military members seen as missionaries. A centurion was a Greek soldier who had his own command and platoon of other individuals under his authority. A centurion is also the first Gentile convert in the book of Acts that we see. This is a soldier during the time of Roman rule who traveled and moved and potentially had the ability to share the story of Jesus. Kind of sounds like a missionary. Sounds real close to a missionary. Um, In Acts 10, 1 through 5, it says, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all of his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. 
And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. This is a Gentile. This is Acts, but this is still a Gentile believer. In the first parts of Acts, the gospel is just being shared with Jewish converts. But Peter received a vision from God also, as we continue to see throughout Acts 10, that said to him, go and meet this military Roman soldier. So he does, being obedient to God and the Spirit. And the centurion invites him into his own house. And Peter shares the gospel with not only just this military soldier and his household, his other soldiers underneath him, his servants, and they're all radically changed. If we look at the end of Acts 10, 47 through 48, we see the Spirit come upon the Gentiles and the Jewish members with Peter are astonished. This is the first time that Gentile converts are receiving the Holy Spirit, that we're seeing them transformed and changed in the New Testament. It literally has the Gentile, the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles and this centurion, a military soldier, is the first one. And now he's a ready-made missionary because of his military status, his constant moving, his constant displacement. There's no mistake for me that Jesus sees the value that the military can bring to the Great Commission for Christians. So why cadence? We know there's a need for the military. Cadence mission of the military is focused on taking community that's already built on hardships and camaraderie, and we just shift that focus to the hope and the love and redemption of Christ. When we have these people who already know the struggles and hardship of being in the military and their need for a community, when you're constantly moving, you understand all too well this need for community. It's so easy for us as missionaries just to open up our home and turn it into a living apologetic for the gospel where they see it that's represented in hospitality and in community. So we operate as Cadence International what's called hospitality houses. And it's this real simple idea. Some of you guys I'm sure know it. It's just opening up our home as a home away from home for them, for these individuals and their families, a place for them to be away from a culture that doesn't promote any kind of health or wealth and, and good well-being. And we get to point them to what true Christian community and hospitality look like, where they can relieve their burdens. They can have this idea of taking their packs off and just be, to be cared and loved and to see their value and worth. Where they're not seen as their jobs, their status, their rank, their sins, their shortcomings, but that they're wonderfully made in the image of God and they're worthy of value. This is what Cadence strives for. Our motto is in 1 Thessalonians 2.8, which says, and so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. It says it in another translation, this is the ESV, and in the NIV it says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives. I love that. It's, it's so true. This is the very idea that was shown to us, myself and Jacqueline, during our personal interactions with Cadence and the place that brought us to want to serve with Cadence. I know firsthand that there is a need for the military to hear the hope of the gospel and that they're worthy of hearing it. They are worthy of hearing it. Because of that, there's an organization like Cadence International that seeks to serve the military where we get to see people transform for the sake of the gospel, to reside with them, to bear burdens together arm in arm. Scripture tells us in Galatians 6 to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Looking at the need to bear burdens points us to the idea of loving one another without any restraint this gospel kind of love, to share our need for community and our need for unity together. We're not meant to strive in these things alone. I know there's a huge emphasis on community here at the bridge, and we see it. Ministry happens in relationship. When you are diving in and living together in community, truly being the body, that is where the gospel can be shared so powerfully. But then there's this aspect of why us. Why, we know there's a need for the military. There's an answer for why Cadence does it. There's just not a lot of missionary organizations that go for the military. But 
Why Tyler and Jacqueline? Why us? Right? I mean, why us? What makes us feel this call? Why should we go? But mine and my wife's story is really intertwined, and I would love for you to share our testimony um, and just how Kate has impacted us through this mindset of discipleship. Is this on? Okay, so I am not a great speaker. Um, my husband is good at that, so bear with me as you guys are the first ones hearing me talk in front of you. Um, so hospitality and the way that um, I really came to know the Lord and the way that Tyler came to know the Lord just kind of um, go right in. It was like the Lord was setting us up to go into hospitality ministry because of how he showed us his grace in the very beginning through that. Um, I, my first duty station was in Mississippi, um, in Biloxi. And um, probably the first couple of weeks I was there, I met a lady named Angie and she was about my mom's age. And she worked in the same clinic as I did um, at the hospital. And she, uh, man, she just invited me to church like the first time I met her and told me to come over her house. And I was thinking, who is this lady? Like, she's acting like we're family and we just met. And even though I had grown up in, I mean, I'm from North Carolina, so I know a little bit about hospitality. You know, you bring people food and you say, hey, y'all, and stuff like that, and you wave on the road. But, I mean, she just really made me feel like I was one of her daughters or that she cared about me so much. And I had just met her, and I didn't know anybody, so I was like, well, I guess I'll take this lady up. You know, I was new there and lonely, and my four walls in my dorm room had gotten pretty lonely. And so I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go to church with her, and I'll, uh, I'll go get some of her food. I was tired of eating the defect, just like the cafeteria on base. So I went and I realized that she just did this for everyone, that her heart was just open to anyone and everyone that needed to come to her house or wanted to. Um, and she loved them with a grace that was just overwhelmingly like what we see in the Bible um, it was beautiful because I, though I had read about how Jesus loved people and um, when Angie saw my sin, which I was living in daily, you know, being surrounded by the military community, she didn't push me away or tell me like, oh, you need to go get fixed. Instead, she said, hey, I see this sin and I want to walk with you through it. Um, Angie invited me to Bible studies and she taught me how to read my Bible. She involved me with like um, women's groups who live life to literally share the gospel. Um, and that was really the changing point of my heart. The Lord used her grace to um, make me see that I literally could not live for anything else but the Lord. Um, through that time, Tyler and I were dating. We weren't married and he was in Japan. And uh, it was kind of funny because I think he had proposed to me at that point, but I was like, Lord, you've changed my heart and I can't marry someone who doesn't see that you are my only reason for living. So me and Angie and my women's group, we started praying for Tyler. And I mean, I was sending Bibles and books and I was doing everything. I was like, Lord, you gotta change his heart. Like, Got a date. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Angie was so faithful, and um, she and the other women around me uh, prayed for Tyler and um, their husbands, the women in the Bible study that I was in, like their husbands reached out to Tyler and tried to answer questions when he had them. And um, though we knew that there was nothing we could do to change Tyler's heart, we knew that we could pray for him and that we could be a community for him to um, speak to about the Lord. And um, I knew that he didn't have that there. So um, we just tried to be that for him. And probably at the end of 2013, that was when Tyler, um, when Tyler spoke and like proclaimed the name of the Lord and said that like, he just said that one day he was reading the Bible and it was like the scales fell off of his eyes. And 
we were like, that's so awesome. Um, we know that only the Lord can change hearts. And just to see the, the word work in someone's life is so transformative. Um, so I was really grateful because now we could get married. <laughs> and yeah, so fast forward about a year and we got married and we, I moved to Okinawa and it was a really hard time. I was sad to leave my friends in Mississippi because at that point I had experienced a Christian community um, that loved one another and that um, walked through trials and ho held each other accountable. Um, and I didn't know what that was gonna look like when we were in Japan. Um, but when we got there, the Lord really, he had just prepared a sweet season of life that we had no idea. I think it was probably the first two weeks we were there, we had tried out a couple of places, but we went to one of the chapels on base, which um, I don't know if you guys have ever been to a chapel, but chapels are ran by usually one or two chaplains. Um, sometimes they agree on their spiritual stance. Sometimes they don't. Usually it's only them and maybe a chaplain's assistant that run the chapel, which looks like maybe Chris and one other guy running this whole church. And um, it's really kind of a mess, but the Lord had placed a chaplain in that chapel during that season of our life who was really devoted to uh, running the chapel as a, a church and it was really cool because he had kind of designated certain people to do a lot of things that normal chapel services wouldn't have. Like um, there was a group of Cadence missionaries there who um, some, our friends being uh, Dave and Andrea, and they were actually a, a part of like the leadership of the student ministries on Okinawa. And so they didn't even run a hospitality house for their ministry. Like they actually were over um, the youth and the children's programs throughout the whole island. However, they ran a hospitality house for us. Um, so the first time we went, Tyler met Dave cause Dave was playing music and Tyler was like, I wanna do worship music. And so we met Dave and Andrea and they immediately invited us into their life and they shared the good, the bad, the ugly with us very quick. It was almost instantly friends. And um, that's something that's definitely needed in the military community because of the transitioning happening so frequently. If you don't instantly become friends or like instantly lay it all out, then you spend I know since we've been in North Carolina, we spent almost the two years that we've been there just trying to build friendships. And I feel like we've just started making friends and that just can't happen in the military. We, you know, military people would always be without a family. And we all know that there is no life without people, so, you know, a community around you. So it was really cool and refreshing to see them um, just, step up and say, hey, this is who we are. We wanna do life with you guys and just invite us in. We did, Tyler and I were newlyweds and we did things like family, like weeknight dinners and we, Tyler, they taught us to serve well, like we served with their youth. And then we also, Tyler served with worship and we did Bible studies and they had discipleship nights, which they discipled us. And I mean, all the while they're like teaching us what it looks like to live as a, a married couple who are serving and um, serving each other and serving the Lord. And it was really great just to see people do that. They taught us so much just about what um, gospel-centered fellowship look like in the Bible. And they helped us through a lot of like hardship our first year of marriage, being on the island and um, just being new to everything. So we were really grateful. What's my last point? That's it. Oh, perfect. It. Let's all give Jack a round. It, it is not easy to, to talk up in front of anyone. So 
That was perfect. So that's because of our interaction with Cadence Missionaries, we were shown that. We were shown what it looked like to be an intentional community together, to read our Bibles, to labor, to be intentional and open, and just to bear and lift one another up. One of the coolest things they showed us is how everyone is worthy of value because they're made in the image of God. That was something that was pressed into us so much in sharing the gospel and bringing strangers into our home and just the joy that everyone matters. Everyone mattered to God and everyone is worthy of value because of being made in the image of God. So this is why we know that we're called to go and work with Cadence specifically because we were those people. We were those people who got transformed, who because of hospitality and because of community, they brought us into our lives and show us what the gospel looks like in the day in and in the day out, in the good and in the bad. And whenever there's one military person who is transformed and sees Jesus as their king and and wants to go to wherever he calls them to go and do whatever he calls them to do, it's this amazing military members that are now in this community and what they can do. They're ready-made missionaries. They get to go because of relocation and temporary duty assignments, things that were hardships, bad issues, struggles. We can turn those hardships into this transformational blessing and they can see the goodness of God by opening up their own homes and hospitality. They can be missionaries. We get to labor with them and say, you get to be a part of this community now. You know what it's like to be in genuine Christian community and you can't turn away from it. Once you've been there and you've tasted what real Christian community looks like where you labor together, you want nothing else but that. I love this from Hebrews 10, 24, 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit for some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is exactly what a testament to Christian community should look like. Never neglecting to meet together, but to make a habit of our need to be together. Encouraging and stirring up one another to love each other unconditionally as we are one in Christ. Jesus' last words to his followers are in Matthew 28. I'm sure many of you have seen this before, the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the commission that was given to us all as Christians. And there is a place for those who go and those who send. Just as Paul made many missionary journeys throughout Acts, Many stayed and saw him off because they were not called to go, but instead to support and sustain him. We are all held to this commission, but it is either to go or to sin. William Carey is one of the greatest missionaries in history. If you don't know who he was, he was the first person to ever bring the gospel into India. And he was speaking to those people who would help send him off. He made two amazing quotes that I just want to share with you both. And it's, is not the commission of our Lord still binding upon us? Can we not do more than now we are doing? That idea still holds true today. And his other most famous quote is, I will go down into the well if you will hold the rope. William Carey painted this imagery of descending into a well while his supporters and friends held the rope of finance and prayer for the gospel to go out and create this huge change in India, and he saw it. This is where we are now. We're gonna go into this well, into this dark to be that very light, into a community to bring the gospel and share the hope of a living and active God who cleanses us and lifts us up with him in the heavenly places through Christ. So as we're called to go, we know that some of you are called to send off those individuals. As my wife and my son, Asher and Emery, and I say yes to Cadence, look at that. Look at those boys. They are beautiful. We're following this call. We're following this call to go with Cadence, to say yes, to go and serve the military with the gospel. We know that the calling to go places where the gospel is ripe 
and this is a ripe place and the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. So please, if the spirit is stirring something in you and touching your heart as we're sharing what the Lord has called us to do, please consider partnering with us in our work for the gospel and for the Great Commission. Please pray and consider this opportunity. I would rather you guys be obedient to the Spirit than walk away and miss an opportunity to foresee, for you to see God move in ways that we couldn't imagine. We've seen what the transformational power of Christ looks like. We've seen it in community. We've seen it in other people. And there's such a gift and a blessing in hospitality and opening up your home. You get to share the gospel in ways you could never imagine. Together, we can invest for the sake of the gospel. So after the end of all the services, if you want, please come and speak with us after the service. Please come and speak to us today at a luncheon after all the services. And honestly, me and Jacqueline, just thank you so much for the time and this opportunity. The Lord has put it on our hearts to go and we are ready. Please pray about partnering with us and sending us to go. Thank you guys. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the Great Commission. We thank you for changing our hearts, Lord, performing this miracle in us, changing us, restoring us, renewing us, and redeeming us, Lord. Thank you for showing us through your word how powerful community is. Father, let the Bridge Church continue to be a place where community is first and foremost. Let it be just a place of your love to bear one another up. Lord, bless our time here. Father, if anyone is stirring, I'd ask them to just continue to press into it. Be obedient to the call. Don't miss an opportunity, Lord. Help us to go and send and see the Great Commission happen, to see the gospel move in military communities. In your name, amen. Let's give them a hand. Come on, let's stand. Let's stand together as we respond through song. I 
like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it Seal it for thy courts above Praising you this morning, God, for who you are. Lord, you're faithful to us. You're so good to us. Lord, thank you that we can be a part of your work, God, that you're doing here in saving lives, God, transforming lives. God, we just, we praise you for salvation that you've given us. God, we thank you for that. Lord, if you gave nothing else, Lord, that would be enough. But God, you still continue to give us blessings upon blessings. So God, we praise you for that this morning and we thank you. Lord, strengthen us as we meet together this morning and Lord, teach us what you have us to hear. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 66. It's the last chapter in the book of Isaiah. And I want to read the first two verses to you. And as you're turning there, again, Tyler and Jacqueline, thank you so much for coming and giving your time, uh, traveling down from North Carolina to be with us. Uh, They will be in town at least till the middle of the week. Uh, So if uh, God's stirring in your heart to say, I'd like to talk some more, uh, he's making himself available uh, all during this time. Many of you may be aware of this, but uh, most may not uh, as well. Uh, In our Southern Baptist Convention, the the, the main... uh, ministry that we partner here with Bridge Community Church, there's a ministry called the Cooperative Program. And through that, uh, the portions that you give here on Sunday, there's portions that are available to go to that ministry and through that ministry. And the Cooperative Program is uh, over 40,000 churches coming together uh, to support and do missions around the world uh, so that those missionaries do not have to raise uh, support but can spend time on the field. the ministry that God has called Tyler and Jacqueline to is beyond that cooperative program support, uh, meaning that they are responsible for raising their funds uh, on their own. Uh, and so the task that we want to be praying for them about is, God, would you, uh, would you please quickly in your timing 
put the right people in place to come alongside them so that they can get to the mission field that God's calling them to. They have to raise 100% of their support before they can get onto the, the mission field. And so that is one reason that we felt led uh, as a church uh, to be praying about God, what can we be doing to help and individually what we can be doing to come alongside of them. And so at 1230 today, we're going to have a lunch back here in the back for uh, Tyler and Jacqueline. Uh, there are about five households that were coming to that. Uh, if you're saying, well, I would still like to hear some more, um, we can't get your lunch, but you can grab lunch and then, and then come meet with us, okay, and sit with us and hear more. That's going to be at 1230 today in the middle room. Um, and you're welcome to come hear more of their testimony, what God's doing and how you might can be a part of it. Or you might know a brother and sister in Christ from another congregation and say, hey, you need to hear what's going on here. Um, come with me at 1230. So I want to encourage you with that. I want to share now out of Isaiah chapter 66, 1 through 2. Please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word that I'm just going to spend a few moments to share of encouragement to you. God says through Isaiah in verse 1, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. So all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who, humble, who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Let's pray. Father God, as we take a moment now to, to uh, share this word to our congregation, God, as we prepare for our mission field this week. God, would you use this word and the word of testimony that's already been given today. God, to uh, just rekindle or maybe set a flame, Lord, in our heart to, to be a part of what you're doing. And God, join you in your life as the invitation has been given to us, Lord, by you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Real quick, I want to just let you have these verses to meditate on this week as you begin your mission field. Uh, the last chapter in this incredible book, challenging book uh, of Isaiah, uh, the last thing that God puts on Isaiah's heart to be reminded in the opening scripture is the sufficiency of God and, the, and, and the, the reality that God is not in need of anything from us. And there's a point to that. Let me, let me read it again. God is saying to his people, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, so all these things came to me. Back in Moses' time, God had the people of God build a tabernacle and gave them instructions on what to do in order so that his presence can come and be with his people. And God did that. And it was the moment uh, in the, the Israelites' history that they cherished to be able to have the presence of God with them as this obscure, tiny nation that everyone would overlook, uh, the, the representation of the tabernacle and that God's presence in the tent of meeting was representation that God is the one, okay, that said, I will come to you and be with you. David, who had a heart for God, then made this, per, made this request, God, I want to build you a, a, a temple. Um, I want to build you a big temple. And he wanted to worship the Lord, you know, but it was also alongside of when he was building his great castle, you know, as well. And, and so he had this idea to build this. And, and God has a similar converse, conversation. Like, what, you know, what can you build, you know, that's actually worthy, you know, of me? And so this, this truth comes back up. And, and I want you to remember this, church. Uh, our God is all sufficient. He is not lacking, okay? Uh, sometimes... Uh, we forget this, and, and, and the reason why I need to bring up this, this truth about God again is because our theology, what we know about God, drives our ministry, okay? And sometimes we can distort this and think that God's in need for us in the way that we express or maybe try to sell other people, you know, into follow him. It's sometimes we can paint a picture of God being this wimpy little guy in the corner that no one wants to be friends with, so let's guilt everybody, okay, into saying, hey, he's really a nice guy. Why don't you come along and be a, side of, uh, be a part of his life? That's not our God. God is not lacking, okay? 
God was not lonely. He was a relational God. There was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is the God of relationships already. He is not lacking. And in this truth, he is saying to the people once again, what could you possibly give me that you're first not dependent upon me for? What is it that you could do for me that I, can't, that I don't have to first do for you? And this is a truth and this is a reality we need to hold on to because it comes right to the purpose of missions and why we live for the Lord. We do not serve God out of some debt requirement of I gotta do this back or give this back to him or he's lacking. We are not like other religions in the world that have to pay homage to a God who says I am needing this and if you don't give it, I'm gonna punish you. Our God is not in need of us. Our God wanted us, not because he needed us, but we needed him. And so he makes this truth to the church and to the, to the congregation and, and to the people there. And he says, I don't have any need from you. You're wanting to do something for me, but I, I'm not in need from anything that you can give back to me. But then he lets us into what we can give. And he gives it in the description of what he does favor and what he does desire. And look at it in verse 2. All these things my hand has made and all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. He who is humble and he who is in contrite spirit and trembles at my word. What does the Lord delight in? A God who's not in need of anything. What does he delight into? Simple truth is this. He delights in the life that's willing to say, I want to be a part of your life, not my own. God, you're so incredible. You have everything. Who you are is amazing. And I just want to be a part of your life. And the only people that really express that are the people in these first, this verse 2 that has these characteristics. A humble, contrite man who fears the word of God. What's humility? Friends, it's not some low self-esteem class where you feel I'm, 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 I'm a nobody. It's just thinking less about yourself, realizing there's something greater than you. The first reality of the gospel is there is one true God. And he has created every one of us into his image. And the privilege that we have is his, the, the, the creature that was created in his image was that we were able to have relationship with him and with others. But it was in this context that we could know something greater than ourselves, the one true God. That this world does not revolve around us, but it is revolving around the purpose and the glory of who God is. And the humble man that recognizes that is the one that steps closer into walking in this incredible life with him. The second is contrite. That word contrite means repent of. That means be broken and sorrowful about your shortcomings. It is to realize the need for something beside yourself. It's not only realizing something's bigger than you, but it's also realizing I'm in need. I've fallen. I'm needing help. It's the life of a repentant heart realizing that I don't have it together, that my sinfulness, my, I'm the issue, and I need something to rescue me from me. And it says the man who trembles at his word, that means it has an awe and a fearness and a willingness to obey and follow. This is the gospel. It's the same invitation that Jesus gave. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my load is easy, and you will find rest for your souls. Friends, God is not telling us to follow him because he is in need of us. God is inviting you to follow him because we are in need of him. And the one that experiences his favor is the one who realizes his greatness and who he is. 
turns from his way of living, turns towards his life, trembles at his words, and follows him. Christianity is not about perfect people. Christianity is about broken people that realize they need something greater than themselves, and that is the God of the universe who's revealed himself through his son, Jesus Christ, and says, come, I don't need your life, but you need mine. So come and follow me. That's the first truth that I want to spin out there to those that may be seeking today, wondering who God is. He is the God who needs nothing from you, but he is the God that can satisfy everything that you're needing. For he is life, and he is the life worth following. And the invitation is this, let go of your life and embrace his life. Tyler and Jacqueline are not going to Cadence International serving because God's in need of them. You understand that? God is not in need of Tyler and Jacqueline. God has invited Tyler and Jacqueline to come join his life in what he's doing. There's a difference, church. There's a difference. He's not in need of us, but he is saying, this is my life. I am the God of restoration. I'm the God of reconciliation. I'm the God who can change and save and turn lives around. Would you like to be a part of that life? And there was a moment in time that you heard in their testimony that they humbled themselves and realized that God was greater than themselves. They repented and with a contrite spirit, they turned and with fear and trembling in allness of who God is, began to follow him in his ways. That same invitation is for every human being who has the ears to hear, has the faith to believe that Jesus is the one true way. And to our missionaries in the room, not just Tyler and Jacqueline, to the the missionaries at Bridge Community Church to start your week, God's not in need of you, but you are in need of his life. And every day he's just inviting you to join him in his life. And would you pray about doing that in whatever capacity God's telling you? Will you humble yourself? Will you be reminded of the gospel? Will you realize your need for the gospel? Would you realize your need for Christ? And would you follow his word in your life? That's the whole purpose of why we gather together, to be reminded of this great God who has everything and gave everything to us because we were in need of him. So what is it can I give God? Chris, I still want to give something to God. Well, well, here's what you can give, your life. You trade in your life for his life, and you follow his way. And friends, let let God show you what that's going to look like in the future. Tyler and Jacqueline, we are so honored that God brought you our way, okay? We are excited about what God is doing in and through your lives and our prayer is that you will continue to follow his, his life and what he's doing. Bridge Community, uh, here's another couple that they're just following the heart of God. I know many of you in this room are so sensitive and care about our military and what's going on in the lives of our military families. What better way to give back to the families of our military than supporting men and women who are going to take the gospel to those folks? and to satisfy their need. Would you begin praying about God? How can I be a a part of that? How can I support that? How can I be a part of your life and what you're doing in Tyler and Jacqueline's life in the lives of the military? And God, help me this week in what you're doing in my life. Go ask the praise band to come back up now and to close us in this song of prayer. Uh, We're gonna close today in a song of prayer. We started it last week, I think, or two weeks ago. And we're gonna conclude with this song again. Heart Abandoned, I believe, is that the song today? We're going to sing Heart Abandon, and we're asking you, church, to make this your prayer today as you prepare for your week. God is not in need of anything from us. We're in need of him. Would we just simply be willing to trade in our life once again and follow his life and be a part of what he's doing for his glory, for his bragging rights, for his greatness? Let's pray that for our life now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for today. 
I ask, Lord Jesus, that, God, we will all realize that, God, we get to be a part of your life. God, people that are lonely and are hurting and are weighed down and burdened, God, that was us. That was every one of us in this room who calls ourselves followers of you. And Lord, it was by your grace and your mercy that you stepped out of heaven. You introduced yourself to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you paved the way for us to be able to be reconciled and restored with your father. And Lord Jesus, it is your life through your spirit that we're able to experience this new life. And God, you don't need us, but you invite us to be a part of what you're doing. And we thank you for that invitation. May everyone in this room understand and know that today. And God, I pray that we will follow you for the rest of our days. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Church, let this be your prayer today as you begin your mission week. God bless you. We love you. secret place where I see your face will you take me there again you can search my heart in the deepest part from beginning to the end to you my eyes are lifting to you my prayer is rising up you've captured my attention consume me oh consume me God give me a heart of Ever after you alone, gold and silver, you can take it. All I want is you, my Lord. Jericho, come and tear down my walls. I am in your hands. You are the promised land. You are the king of my flesh is weak will you help me see that you are all that I need oh Jesus 
you are all that I need. Come on, we pray together. Oh God, give me a heart abandoned ever after you alone. Gold and silver you can't prayer this morning, God. God, that you would give us this heart. God, abandoned to you. God, forsaken the things of the world and following hard after you, Jesus. Would you give us this kind of heart? God, we need it. We need you to do this in us. And God, as we leave and walk out of this place and go our separate ways this week, Father, would people, would people see Jesus in our conversations in our actions, and how we respond to things. God, would that be uh, our prayer today? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, hadn't it been good to be here today? Thank you guys for being here. Hope you have a great week. You're dismissed. See you later. <laughs>